Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to listen. I'm delighted to talk about Hannah and Grace today. Um, as I did the research for this Wilton Historical Society exhibit on suffrage, I noticed that the theme of motherhood kept reappearing in both Hannah and Grace's sources and in wider national and state level sources. So it became a theme that I was really interested in pursuing further and understanding how the idea of motherhood fed into these women's ideas of why suffrage was necessary, not just for themselves, but for the nation, and why suffrage was something that they deserved by virtue of their status as mothers, both to their own children and in a way to their own communities around them. So motherhood may seem at first glance like something that's very much a private matter, something that very much exists only in the domestic spaces. It might also seem to some of us, particularly in the wake of some feminist movements in the 20th century, as something that is not so much an asset to women's freedoms and independence and even political power, but is something that might have to be managed or even overcome in order to achieve a woman's full potential. But historically in America, motherhood has actually very much been something that has a close association with women's perceived values, both in that domestic space and in public spaces, um, but also something that really feeds into and defines what their influence in society should be. And something that has really shaped their struggles for political power and for full citizenship in the United States. So what I'm really gonna focus on today is how Grace and Hannah saw themselves as mothers, what they understood to be, and how, through what I call the politics of care or politics of caring, how they framed those ideas as something that made them deserve suffrage and something that made the nation require women's suffrage in order to prosper and to achieve its full potential as well. So first, uh, let me fire up my PowerPoint. So I'm gonna share the screen here. If I can find my mouse. Where did my mouse go? My mouse has literally disappeared. Oh, there it is. Oh, shoot. Okay, my computer sometimes does this. The mouse is not responding. Let me see if I can get it to work. I apologize for this. Of course, this would happen now. Okay, it looks like I have control back and we will share the screen. Oops, now I've lost control again. I do apologize. Mm. Julie, if you can't get it, I can. Uh, uh, Kim, yeah, if you can pull it up. You emailed it to me, right? Let me look for it. Just give me a sec here. Mm. Well, I'll start talking just so we don't lose yep. too much time here. I'll start talking in the meantime. So just a quick introduction, again, of our two major women, Hannah uh, Raymond Ambler and Grace Knight Schenk. So Hannah was born in 1843, and she lived through 1925. That, of course, means that she was able to participate in that first uh, vote that women were able to participate in in 1921 voting for the president, and she recorded that in her diary. Uh, she was born and raised in Wilton. In 1872, she married Charles Augustus Ambler, and in 1873, she had her first of two sons, Louis Raymond Ambler. A couple years later, in 1875, she had her younger boy, Charles Meeker Ambler. So she was a mother of two sons, and um, beyond that, how she becomes involved in suffrage is not just through motherhood, of course, which I'm focusing on today, but there's a lot of other very practical, very, um, very still sub quite substantial ways that she becomes involved in suffrage. And I'll just gloss those briefly. We won't focus on them. But uh, one is participation in women's clubs, particularly the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution. She through that organization becomes very good friends with and close associates with the Hill family of Norwalk. This is the family that produces Clara Hill, um, Helena Hill-Weed, and Elsie Hill, who are all very well-known suffragists 
who give suffragist speeches and engage in, in various demonstrations across the country, including in front of the White House in the 1917 and 1918, and, and Helena Hill Weed gets herself arrested in that location. So the Hill sisters, through the DAR, certainly seem to be involved in drawing Hannah into an interest in suffrage. In addition- Excuse me, Julie, mm -hmm. can you see, see it now? I do, yes. Okay, just let Stop. me know when you want me to change. Perfect. Um, so in addition to that, she is involved in another club, another women's club out of Norwalk called the Women's Central Association. She becomes involved with them primarily because they rent a location from her for their headquarters. Uh, Hannah is a landlord. And this organization does a lot of outreach to middle class women, but also to women who are poor, who are widowed, who are struggling. And they provide a forum for those women to sell various goods that they produce to try and hold on to some sort of a middle class lifestyle, which is something that Hannah thought was very important and a very noble thing to do. So that sort of activity, it's well established that being involved in women's clubs is one of these gateways into an interest in suffrage for many women of Hannah's generation. Finally, I just also mentioned that Hannah's sister, Elizabeth Raymond, was also involved in suffrage, and that both of these women were members of the Wilton Equal Franchise League. They were both clearly involved in the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association and the National American Women's Suffrage Association as well. They received mail and flyers and newsletters from both of those organizations. Uh, sources that we have for Hannah, just so you know where I'm getting my information from, we have her scrapbooks. Those contain content that she collated from newspaper articles and clippings from about 1871 through about 1912. And then we also have her daily diary entries. We've got those daily diary entries from 1899 all the way through 1924. So we've got quite a lot of information from Hannah's own hand. Was born in 1877, so she's a full generation or so younger than Hannah. She dies in 1931. She was born in New Jersey. She was raised in New York City. She goes to college and in 1904, she becomes a registered nurse. So she has a professional life. In 1909, she marries George uh, uh, Ernest G. H. Schenck, who is a Belgian diamond merchant. And in 1911, she moves to Wilton. She has, thank you, Kim. <laughs> she, has, uh, she has three children, Philip, born in 1910, Jean, born in 1913, I believe, and then Georgian, born in about 1915. So she has, once again, like Hannah, she has personal experience as a mother, and um, that is going to be part of her approach to suffrage as well. She is probably drawn into suffrage through her educational experience and through her family. We don't know specifically, but we can guess because her sister, her older sister, was a major suffragist in New Jersey and um, testified before legislative bodies in New Jersey frequently about suffrage. So it's quite possible that she was inspired by her older sister and that more broadly her family was pro-suffrage and that that was her entry point. Um, she was founder, a founder and president for many years of the Wilton Equal Franchise uh, Association that was founded in 1911. She was vice chairman of the Connecticut branch of the Women's Congressional Union in 1915. This was the precursor to Alice Paul's National Women's Party. That was the organization that picketed the White House. She was also during First World War, this is the time when many suffragists turned to war efforts and war work in order to further prove women's, women deserving of suffrage. During wartime, she was chairwoman of the Woman's Land Army of Connecticut, the Connecticut branch of this nationwide effort to provide female farm labor as a substitute for missing male farm labor during the war. Sources for Grace include letters that she wrote in her position as chairwoman of the Woman's Land Army. Those all date to 1917 and 1918. We also have numerous newspaper articles on her activities. 
And then we also have her daughter, John Shanks' uh, memoir called Grey Nest, a family album. Grey Nest, of course, was the family's residence in Wilton, which is about where the Stop and Shop in Wilton Center is now. So with these two women, if they are approaching suffrage and saying we deserve suffrage because we're women and the nation, excuse me, because we're mothers and the nation needs mothers involved in the political process, one of the first questions we need to deal with is what did they think a mother was? Not just basically biologically, but in terms of what sort of care a mother should offer, what methodology she should follow in offering that care, and what kinds of care would be most effective and impactful in achieving the kinds of ends you wanted in terms of what a child was gonna grow up to be like. This is what I'm calling the politics of care. All of that description is politics of care. Any aspect of care, how it becomes politicized into these concerns with what a mother is doing and then what sort of output the nation is receiving in terms of a child who grows into an adult who is first and foremost, from the nation's perspective, a citizen. Are they a good citizen or are they a bad citizen? That is posited as going back to how the mother cared for the child. In American history, there are numerous different phases, numerous different trends or paradigms that scholars have identified in terms of American motherhood. So there's a whole bunch of them, but we're only going to deal with three that are kind of catch-alls for their time periods, but um, it allows us to not have to go into such fine detail as some of the scholars who make a living off of this go into. So these three overlapping paradigms, and overlapping uh, in time period as well as in some of their content, these overlapping paradigms of American motherhood that I will talk about Hannah and Grace in relation to are Republican, sentimental, and scientific. So the first one, Republican motherhood, don't think Republicans as the Republican Party. Think of Republican as in, as in the Republic, the American Republic. It is associated in terms of its origin point with the Revolutionary War with 1776, and in terms of its time period of influence, it begins around 1776, and it's still going strong as an influence in 1921 when we have suffrage, and arguably it even continues beyond that. What is it? What does it think of the family as? What does it think of the mother as? For the first point, it posits that the family is something of a mini republic, a blueprint for and a building block of a fledgling nation. It sees mothers within that family that is so important as this building block of a nation. It sees mothers as the dominant parent, particularly in a child's earliest formative years. In large part, that is simply because she is most present in a child's life at those times. Father is off working outside the home, mother is working inside the home. Therefore, mother has most contact with the child. Mother has most formative influence over the child. So what she does or does not do, the kinds of care she offers will create the citizen for the future. And therefore, what she does in the home is of grave political concern to American citizens and to the American nation. Mother, first and foremost, is meant to teach her child she is meant to teach literacy, she is meant to teach obedience, she is meant to teach mathematics, all of the life skills that you are very good at interpreting when I should go, when you should go to the next slide, Kim. Very good, thank you. She is meant to um, provide all of this kind of education for the child that will fit them for future service to the nation. The mother's biological role in Republican motherhood is very much stressed. So not only does she simply have the presence with the child to influence it, she physically as a body influences the child through the nourishment she offers through breast milk. And mothers during this time period in, in the 1700s and early 1800s are very much condemned if they reach out and use the services of a wet nurse or if they bottle feed. 
both of those uh, are associated with greater infant mortality at this time. People didn't understand about germ theory. They were not sterilizing those bottles. So this wasn't completely imagined. These mothers were viewed as negligent and as harming the future of the nation. Bodies were needed, adults were needed, and for that you needed ch children to survive. Ultimately under this idea of Republican motherhood, care that the mother provides isn't primarily about emotion or love. Care is about personal, familial, and national survival. In it, just to recap, mothers are primarily responsible for making good citizens. No political powers or status for women is really required beyond the home. What they do is of grave political significance, but it can be accomplished entirely within the home. They don't need the vote. They don't need to be on the legislature. They certainly don't need to be president. They can take care of it within the home. And that, moreover, is where their focus should be for the prosperity of the nation. So was Hannah a Republican mother? Did she frame her ideas around suffrage around the idea of being a Republican mother? There's some evidence that she does. Uh, this uh, first image, by the way, um, I'll return to Hannah in a moment. This first image is a little later. It's uh, 1869 but it is largely playing into the ideas of Republican motherhood. On the left, this lady who is sitting in a chair, she's labeled the domestic mother. She is dressed plainly. She has on that table to her left, she has writing implements suggesting her potential to educate her children. Behind her on the mantelpiece piece, she has a clock suggesting you know, punctuality, time consciousness, respect, obedience, self-control perhaps. She has her children around her, so she is clearly putting in the effort that is required. She has that contact. All the decorations are relatively utilitarian or focused on the family. There are portraits on the walls that are presumably of the family, though we don't know that for certain. And one other thing to note is that the light in the scene is provided by the fire. It is utilitarian, it is cheap, and she is making do with that. The woman who is dressed in this ball gown, on, in contrast, is labeled the fashionable mother. She is frivolous. She's focused on herself, on her own enjoyment. She's clearly spent a great deal of money on this gown in comparison to our domestic mother. All that we see around her is about looking good or taking care, has nothing to do with taking care of her children. We see uh, the vanity, we see the full length mirror, there's cosmetics on the table, and moreover, she's wasting money, not just on the dress, but on the candlelight. Candlelight being more expensive than simply burning wood and getting your light from the fire. So we have a little vignette here of these two different mothers and which one is considered by the Harper's Weekly in 1869 to be the superior mother. Now, if you go to the next image, returning to Hannah here, We've got little bits excerpted from one of the articles that she clipped and included in one of her scrapbooks. And the article was on the Countess Castellane and her two children. The Countess Castellane was an American woman who married a French nobleman. But in this article, she insists that the children she has recently born will be educated in America and that they will be taught to love America, their mother's country, as much, if not more, than they will be taught to have affection for France, their father's country. So this is suggesting that Hannah might indeed have some ideas of Republican motherhood because she is focused on American values, um, allegiance to America, patriotism, love of the country. She is clipping this article that is focused on another American woman, despite these French connections, insisting that her children will have these American-focused values and uh, allegiances. So there's some suggestion here that yes, Hannah was influenced by or interested in the idea of a Republican motherhood. Uh, the next, not the next slide, I don't believe I have this on a slide, uh, but the next clipping from her scrapbooks that is of interest is from an article called Habits of Obedience for Boys. 
And this article posits that a boy's entire future as a man really hangs upon his mastering obedience in his childhood. Because to be a leader, to be successful in America, particularly in the field of business, which recurs as a signifier of being American in so many articles at this time, for this boy to achieve as a man, first he must learn to obey himself. If he fails in self-control, he is going to be limited in his future to being a subordinate. He will never be a leader. And obviously the country needs leaders. It can't be composed entirely of subordinates. The person who is, who, upon whom the onus rests for teaching obedience is the mother. The article says that upon the mother rests the deepest responsibility of this portion of the home training, she being more constantly the boy's companion. She, not the father, must teach the boy obedience. And this is very much playing into the idea of Republican motherhood, that the mother, because she is present most, carries the greatest responsibility for shaping the future of the child and the nation. Now we can go on to the next slide. Um, what have we got? Okay, so just ignore this one for the moment, um, but we'll talk about Grace as a Republican mother briefly as well. Uh, for Grace, she's focused less on the rearing of boys, which all of the clippings we found from Hannah are, and that's very relevant to her own personal experience. She had two boys. For Grace, she's very much focused not on Republican motherhood within her own family, though that does show up, she focuses even more on mothering her community and mothering the nation in sort of a Republican fashion. Just to you know, mention her own family, she focuses a great deal on education in her family. Her children are, she helps her children with spelling, speeches, recitations, writing their own poems and plays. She sends them to piano lessons. She engages French and English tutors. She does a whole bunch of education work with her children. So she definitely, in a Republican motherhood line, takes seriously the requirement that she educate her children. But more of what she does that seems to link to her ideas of suffrage and why she as a mother might deserve suffrage seems to be related to where she goes beyond the family. And this is a key difference between herself and Hannah. Uh, Grace consistently pushes beyond the family, whereas Hannah tends to stay more within the family in terms of her ideas of motherhood. One thing that Grace does is uh, in 1917, during the war effort, early war effort, she is involved in teaching canning, canning of food for an immigrant women in nearby cities. Uh, a newspaper report about her doing this in Stanford has her quoted as saying that canning is a great force for education and socialization. So she is mothering other women, particularly women who a middle-class woman like Grace is going to identify as potentially problematic, poor and immigrant women, women who need to be made more American, who need to be made more middle-class, she is going to teach them canning, and this is going to socialize them into being more like she believes they should be to be good assets to the American nation and to their communities. She also reaches out through politics and educating women in politics and in the need to participate in politics. And this is another way that she arguably mothers the community. In 1924, she is quoted in a article as saying that women's participation in politics from the bottom level up is something that, quote, ensures the nomination of the best candidates and laying the right foundation upon which to build the national superstructure. Women need to be involved from the very beginning at those formative years in a child's life and in the formative stages of political life to have the national superstructure be achieved to its best ability. So there's a nice parallel there between the family and politics. Finally, in 
also in the World War I context, there's mothering of volunteers in the Women's Land Army. This is particularly through the role of these women who are called chaperone housekeepers, who oversaw units of these female volunteers who would then go out and do day labor on farms and then come home and be taken care of in their temporary homes by these chaperone housekeepers. The chaperone housekeepers were meant to be um, very moral figures. They were meant to be people who would see that, as Grace said, that the women would wash their hands and say their prayers, who would see that they were properly nourished, and who would see that they didn't go astray and, and become known for flirting or any of the other various things that young women might be fall prey to when they are off away from their you know, home life and, and, and working on the farm. So these women, the mothering was required not so much to make those women better, though that was part of it, it was to ensure that their labor could benefit the nation. So arguably this could be another instance where Grace is acting and thinking in terms of Republican motherhood, that she sees the achievements of these women feeding into a successful war effort as something that is going to justify suffrage. And indeed, most suffragists during World War I saw women's labor and women's war efforts as something that was going to be persuasive to the powers that be in achieving suffrage. So Grace is not particularly unique in that. Um, that is something that um, most suffragists, particularly in Connecticut, this was certainly true, were engaged in. So in summary, with Republican motherhood, Grace and Hannah both appear to have believed that women needed political power in order to guarantee that the nation was composed of educated, patriotic, good citizens. Women's influence, essentially mothering the body politic, was necessary to ensure this, and suffrage was a necessary means to that end. Now this is a bit in contrast to what I said early about, earlier about Republican motherhood in its earlier stages. At first, it was all within the family. Everything of political significance that women were doing, they could do in the home. They made great citizens. They didn't need to go out and vote. They didn't need to go out and be in the legislature. But Grace and Hannah are living, you know, 100 plus years after this initially formed. So things have changed in the meantime, and they have adapted the ideas of Republican motherhood. They have mixed them with other trends in American history. And the result is that they see the same inputs being put into motherhood, they see the same values, but they have a different conclusion as to what sort of political outcome this requires for women. They do believe, in contrast to earlier thinkers, that political power, the vote, is necessary. The next one, which this illustration goes with, the next paradigm of motherhood that's in film, oh, go back to that image, uh, please, Kim. Uh, this image shows a nice illustration of sentimental motherhood, where the mother is a figure who is dominant in terms of her love for her children. Whereas under Republican motherhood, it's the fact that she is present, it's the fact that she teaches, she is a fairly austere and strict type mother. Under sentimental motherhood, the mother is pure love. This image shows an adult son contemplating his mother who is for the moment quiescent and potentially helpless. Really, she's just sleeping, she's taking a nap before she gets up and does more work, which is what the sentimental mother does. Work is something that she does constantly to the point of exhaustion through self-sacrifice to give everything and all to her children because that is really what defines her, um, love and work. Sentimental motherhood is the dominant paradigm of motherhood in America. So you'll see it in images, you'll see it in stories, you'll see it in newspaper articles, in diaries, in people's self-conceptions. It really dominates from around the 1830s or 1840s 
up through around the 1910s. So this is, image is actually quite a late manifestation of, of sentimental motherhood. In addition to the idea that love conquers all in terms of a mother, there is the idea that the mother is never scolding or angry. A good mother is always patient. She will also instill religion along with education. This is a contrast with Republican motherhood where fathers really were still in charge of the spiritual development of children. Under sentimental motherhood, mothers have taken over that role. Mother is self-sacrificing and mother works, as I mentioned, to the point where she is exhausted, but exhaustion for the mother is really a blissful state because she has done all of this in self-sacrifice for her children. And ultimately, children who are loved properly by their mother will grow up into ideal adults. So the methodology has changed. You're still going for the ideal citizen. You're still going for the ideal adult, but the way mothers are supposed to achieve that has changed dramatically under sentimental motherhood. The way suffragists like Hannah and Grace used this paradigm of sentimental motherhood to argue for suffrage was by saying, and this was a very common argument from the mid 1800s onwards, they would argue that women's participation in politics will inject morality, universal love and spirituality into it. Can you imagine politics, especially today, with universal love in it? Wouldn't that be nice? It would be very foreign and very confusing, but it might be fairly useful. So that is what, if women were love, they would bring love, they would bring all these positive things, all these positive characteristics to the body politic, to politics itself, and this would fix most everything. Unfortunately, you also have a nice opening for a counter argument here, which anti-suffragists exploited to the full. And that is, if women are so pure, so wonderful, so focused on and full of love, if you expose them to the corrupting world of politics, it's not the mother's love that will win, but rather the corruption of the political sphere that will dominate. So women going out into politics is going to ruin women. It's either going to make them less womanly, less full of love, less of all these things, or it's actually going to completely desex them. So it's going to make them essentially into men. There are even these kind of cartoons that you see, and you see versions of this as late as the 1920s, where the accusation is essentially that if a woman becomes exposed to politics, she will essentially her husband will lose all interest for her because she's going to turn into basically a man, very unattractive, very, you know, losing all those aspects about her, which make her an object of affection or of attraction. And you will then have this crisis of no more babies. So that's sort of the, uh, the extreme place that that argument gets taken to. So, but for, for suffragists, of course, they argue that society needs women to have political power and public status. The nation needs mothering. Hannah is a sentimental mother. Now we can go on to that next slide, Kim. This is an excerpt from a poem that Hannah clipped and included in her scrapbook called My Mother's Hands. It is about a self, well, it's written from the perspective of an adult child of the mother. And it's about a self-sacrificing mother who's going to be rewarded in heaven for her ideal motherhood. She has given her all. She has worked to the point that her hands are old and wrinkled and beautiful to no one but the adult child. She's exhausted. She's near death. And this object of great pity, but she's going to be rewarded in heaven because she's this ideal sentimental mother. What's more, her child expects to join her in heaven. Because this is a successful sentimental mother, she has passed on morality. She has passed on spirituality. So she has saved her son, essentially, or her daughter. And that person expects to join her in heaven. So this particular poem is just suffused with the ideals of sentimental motherhood. The next slide, another clip from Hannah's scrapbooks, is from an article called No Title Like Mother. And this one 
really posits that motherhood is the pinnacle of a woman's existence. It is her highest calling. It talks about mothers as risking death and therefore deserving honor. It says willingly she goes down into the valley of the shadow of death, that she may rise almost glorified in her new honor. It also posits that not all mothers are worthy of the title. Some mothers are selfish. And this, of course, is one of the greatest sins in the ideal of a sentimental mother, the mother who is selfish, the mother who takes too much from her children, who puts herself above other, um, above her children's interests. That is certainly not something that is allowed in sentimental motherhood. So even as sentimental motherhood becomes this framework that suffragists can use to expand on or to argue for the expansion of their rights, it also has this very limiting factor where women aren't really allowed to care for themselves at all. If they are a good mother, everything, all of their care goes to their children. So it's a double-edged sword as so often occurs in, in these various ideas of not just motherhood, but other things affecting gender identities. So there's also, I just want to do a quick shout out on the next slide to the diary entry, which was uh, featured in the WHS exhibit. This was taken from a Norwalk float during the uh, July 4th, 1913 uh, parade. And it was a, a suffragist slogan, mother mends our stockings, mother mends our coat. Maybe mother could mend some laws if mother had a vote. This could arguably be a shout out to sentimental motherhood as well. It certainly focuses on the work that mother achieves and possibly gestures towards mother's moral influence, being able to mend some laws if she had the vote. Arguably also, um, Hannah may have been acting as a sentimental mother in relation to other women through the central club that I mentioned she was a participant in. Uh, that club offered services to women. I mentioned that poor, and, and, uh, poor women and women who were widows could bring in embroidery, could bring in cookery that they had done, and they could sell that and thus hope to make a living. That is possibly a way in which Hannah is offering care to other women uh, and making them hopefully into better citizens. Those mothers are going to be able to stay with their families. They're going to be able to keep the family together rather than breaking it apart. Um, and that is something that is going to be contributing to societal stability. A quote about the Central Club that appeared in the Norwalk Hour said that it was composed of ladies laboring as those of one mind whose whole thought is to benefit and brighten humanity. That is very definitely in the sentimentalist mode. So sentimental motherhood is not necessarily limited to your own children. You can certainly approach other people, particularly other women, in that same frame of mind of trying to improve them. So next slide, let's see what that is. Okay, so just ignore that one for now. Um, we have the question of Grace. Was Grace a sentimental mother? There's really not a lot of evidence that she was. She definitely shows Republican influences, and as we'll see in a minute, she definitely shows scientific motherhood uh, leanings, but we really don't see much for sentimentality. However, we do have one newspaper article where she makes the argument that women deserve the vote because they have the greater moral force. She says, women should appreciate the great gift which they now hold, that of having the opportunity of lifting up the political standards and exerting a great deal of influence. Whether she truly believes this, this is the only instance we have of her expressing this, or if she's really adopting and kind of recycling one of these very standard suffragist arguments, I have no idea. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have as much insight because we don't have diaries, we don't have scrapbooks from Grace, so we have a little less information into her psyche. But there is this evidence that perhaps sentimental motherhood meant something to her. Uh, it certainly makes sense that it's very much more present in Hannah's thinking because of the time period 
that she had her children. They were born in 1873 and 1875. That is the height of sentimental motherhood. She's right in the middle of it. That's all the sorts of uh, media that she's going to be consuming at this time, all the advice that she's going to be getting at this time as a mother herself. It's all going to be coming from sentimental motherhood. For Grace, when she has her children, that's in the early 1910s, and that's outside of the overwhelming you know, influence of sentimental motherhood. So it makes sense that she's less there. To sum up on sentimental motherhood, uh, Hannah definitely more influenced than Grace, but both women believed that female participation in politics would lift it to a higher, more moral, more spiritual plane. The influence of women, especially of women as mothers, was necessary to reform and lift up the political standards and to benefit and brighten humanity. Suffrage was clearly the way to achieve these ends. Finally, scientific motherhood. We have perfect babies. Who doesn't want a perfect baby? Uh, perfect babies are going to be, and scientific motherhood as well, are going to be the thing from about the 1880s or 1890s through the 1920s and really beyond, certainly into the 1950s. According to the paradigm of scientific motherhood, it's not mother's love at all. We're going to completely abandon mother's love. Of course, mother will still love you, but that's not the important thing. What matters is that you are raised according to very specific scientific regimens that are dictated by pediatricians. The field of pediatrics develops in the 1890s. So that's really going to be the beginning of this uh, field of scientific motherhood. It's really gonna date more 1890s. Mother's instincts and love alone are insufficient. Moreover, they're often ill-advised. Mother's love can literally kill you. It is a dangerous thing if it is not moderated by science. And although I hate to say this, the scientists had a point. Between 1900 and 1920 in this country, infant mortality fell from about 120 per thousand births to 71.7 per thousand births. And that is a huge difference. It's nearly cutting it in half. And this was all achieved before antibiotics are available. It's coming out of the theory, of the germ theory that was dating to the late, late 1800s and widely accepted in the early 1900s. So sanitation, washing your hands, sterilizing that bottle that the Republican mothers thought was killing babies. Well, it was. Sterilizing it makes it safe. And it also feeds into the argument under scientific motherhood that formula might actually be superior to breast milk. So women's bodily functions as ideal mother aren't even there anymore under scientific motherhood. It's far better to offer your baby a bottle with scientifically formulated you know, milk product in there. And that is going to make your baby more perfect, more uniform, more ideal, and more likely to be able to grow up as a good contributor to the nation. You have to have that good physical you know, basis of the child to grow into the contributing adult. Now, I mentioned uniformity. These perfect babies, you know, they look a little different, right? Actually, the one on the far left is, is giving me slight Hitler vibes. Um, sorry about that. But um, so these children are as uniform as possible. Their mothers are coming from Often these, these kind of ideal baby or perfect baby competitions would be held at fairs. Uh, they were often focusing on poor and immigrant women's children and trying to override all of those variations in culture and really produce a, a consistent, you know, and this is melting pot essentially, melting pot as produced by scientists, as produced by pediatricians and pediatric advice, trying to override all of the differences and approaches between the Italian immigrants and the Spanish immigrants and the German immigrants and everybody else, and trying to create an ideal American child. So if we go to the next slide. More babies, many nationalities. Here is the uh, 
I can't quite see all of it, but the future, future American citizens, melting pot, instructing uh, how to care for these is, is going to, you know, properly, it's going to make health and happiness. I can't read the whole thing, unfortunately, but this is an American Red Cross photo and uh, the American Red Cross, along with many government agencies at this time in the early 1900s, were joining scientists in providing advice to mothers on how to produce ideal perfect babies who would then join the melting pot, become the same in terms of their physical development and culture, and who would then provide this ideal basis for national proliferation and economic prosperity and ability to defend against enemies and all that good stuff. So these uh, children are once again, destined to be you know great americans that is the idea and science is going to guarantee it not mother's love and not mother's presence in the children's lives just to point out here that we're seeing under scientific motherhood what we're seeing is a resurgence of male dominated decision making in early childhood republican motherhood and sentimental motherhood particularly took some of that power from the father and put it on the mother. Under the mother, really, the whole onus of the child's development is on mother. Father is hardly even present. In scientific motherhood, male decision-making is back, but it's not the father. It's scientists, it's doctors, and it's government representatives, some of whom by this time period, especially into the 20s, are actually women. So it's not universally male-dominated, but um, the power is being removed arguably from both parents and being put on to these other experts. In a change from sentimental motherhood under scientific motherhood, work is simply work and exhaustion in the service of family and in the service of your babies. It's no badge of honor. It's simply a sign that you do not know enough about domestic science. You don't know the energy saving and time saving methods of properly taking care of your household or of your children. Just a quick uh, foray into some of the governmental interventions. This is really interesting what was going on in the early 1900s. If you move to the next slide, we have a poster, I believe, for mother's pensions. By 1919, 39 states had these. They were not very good in terms of being able to reach all the mothers who needed them, but the ideal was there at least. Uh, this was a program, a government-funded program, where mothers, particularly widows, um, that's, that's who it was, widows, were receiving pensions from the state so that they could keep their families together, so that they would not have to work extended hours in the market, place uh, or wherever they were working uh, so that their families could benefit from mother's presence. So even in a scientific motherhood period, mother is important because she maintains the scientific regimen, right? So this is one way the state actually becomes involved in trying to enforce good motherhood. Another way is that uh, Congress from the 1910s on actually sponsors home economics courses for women. Can you imagine that? Mother's Day is officially recognized in 1914, more focus on the mother. There's the Shepherd Towner Maternity and Infancy Act in 1921. This is legislation that through 1927 provides federal funding for public health nurses, well baby clinics and maternal education. There's also, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, there's these early 20th century labor laws that limit women's labor uh, in factories and such to eight hours a day. And in fact, they also say that women can't work night shifts. And this, when I learned about it in elementary school, I remember it being framed in our textbook as rights, for human rights, of not abusing workers by forcing them to work these long hours. That carries definite weight, but at the same time, we should also recognize that it's a way the state is trying to enforce good motherhood. You won't be away from your family more than eight hours. If you're away from 
the family more than eight hours, you can't be a good mother. If you work a night shift and you're away from the children at night, you can't provide good motherhood, good mothering. And moreover, if women are allowed to work more than eight hours at eight hour shifts, they're potentially taking away from men's earnings and from men's ability to be the breadwinners. So there's some negative or, or less pretty aspects of these labor laws as well that play into scientific motherhood, but also into you know, stresses between the genders at this time. So in summary, mother's overwhelming love and compassion is less important than hitting certain growth marks, staying within certain weight brackets, and being taken care of on a strict unbending regimen designed as a one size fits all by pediatricians. That's what really matters at this time. In addition, and this is kind of the plus side of scientific motherhood for most women, there's really no recognized need anymore for women to suffer over much, either during labor or while laboring to take care of their children later on. There are actually four labor for the birthing process. There is, uh, at this time, there are products available that can ease the pain to actually put women to sleep so that they you know, go to sleep, they wake up and they have a baby and they don't you know, have to go through the suffering anymore. That's mostly available to middle-class women, uh, but it is something that is associated with the scientific motherhood aspect. Also part of the trend that eventually leads most births to be in hospitals rather than at home. In addition, uh, another aspect of scientific motherhood that is arguably of benefit to most women is that there is a newly, uh, new stress on limiting family size, on family planning and birth control, and that this is something that is regularly billed as being better for the financial prospects of the family, but also on a less attractive front as being better for the genetic prospects of the nation. Uh, we should remember that much of these discussions and scientific motherhood and mother's pensions, all of these things are happening in the time period when eugenics is very popular in America and also in Germany, and that's going to lead to all the awful things that occur in World War II, dealing with eugenics in the German population, but uh, eugenics is not something that the Nazis had, uh, you know, a monopoly over. This is something that was extremely popular, the ideas of trying to improve the nation through birth control, through controlled breeding, was very popular in the American context in the early 1900s as well. So was Hannah a scientific mother? We've got very little evidence that she was. Uh, she did have a small family that probably, but not necessarily indicates some kind of birth control on her part that would have been possible for her in the 1870s, particularly as a middle-class woman. But there's better explanations in the 1870s than scientific motherhood to explain that small family size. Uh, we do have evidence that she didn't think that working to exhaustion was particularly honorable. We've got a clipping in one of her scrapbooks called A Happy Home that posits that women should work less and give up some household duties, things like putting too much starch in the wash that was really about vanity and being fashionable, that they should stop doing that and instead focus on being better mothers and really not spoil their good influence by losing their temper because they're all tired out. Uh, you could also, explain that and put it under sentimental motherhood because it has to do with mother losing her temper, which she's never supposed to do. I think it fits there just as well as it arguably fits under scientific motherhood. So that's the best we've got for Hannah. It doesn't appear that this model of motherhood particularly appealed to her or framed her approach to suffrage. Grace, on the other hand, I would argue that this is the dominant paradigm of motherhood for her. So if you go to the next image, let's see what that is. What do we got? Ah, oh, okay. This is, um, I forgot to mention this one. This is a menace to society, the Paget family. Uh, they were all illiterate. Mother and children were all illiterate. And the youngest boy uh, to the mother's side there was nearly blind. Uh, from disease. The eldest boy, you can see his hand is bandaged. He had recently hurt himself in a factory. And uh, really, no one was contributing to society. No one was 
prescribed according to regimen. No one was being you know, educated in a, an appropriate fashion. So this image is one that Lewis Hine produces for the uh, National Child Labor Committee, I believe it was called. And uh, it is meant to illustrate the need for government interventions like the mother's pension plan. Uh, if you go to the next slide, let's see what we've got. Okay, so that's Grace and her children. So Grace is a scientific mother. Grace really does uh, dive into this. And I think it's largely because she was a nurse. She was a trained registered nurse and she had training particularly in the fairly new science of dietetics. She believed that diet and a scientific diet was incredibly important, not just in raising children and making them strong and healthy, maybe even moral and well-educated, but it was also incredibly important in invalid care, in curing people from various diseases and in helping them recover from various injuries. So for Grace, we would expect in her own life with her own children that she's going to focus on, on diet. And she really does. Uh, for housekeeping and cooking for her own family, she plans meals according to dietetics. She doesn't always cook them herself, however. She really hires out a lot of the work to cooks and housekeepers and nurses and various subordinates. But this fits perfectly with scientific motherhood because it's not mother's love, not to say she denied them love. She, she probably gave them as much love as, as was possible. But Mother's personal touch is not the main factor here. Rather, the best thing the mother can do for the child and for the nation in the future is to raise her children scientifically. So dietetics and having strict regimens. That is what is going to do the job. Now, if we can go to the next slide, please, Kim. Grace also mothers, as we saw in Republican motherhood, her participation there, she is very much focused on and very active in mothering beyond her family. And here we have a newspaper clipping of her mothering soldiers during World War I. These are American soldiers who are over in France and she is very concerned about getting sugar to them. And she particularly wants to get them sugar in the form of jam the kind that mother makes every fall and that has tempted every generation of active boys to all manner of contriving to obtain it. Soldiers, after all, are only boys grown up. So the idea here, we, we aren't used to thinking of sugar as a healthy thing, but at this moment in time, sugar was viewed as quite healthy, particularly as an appetite stimulant. So for injured people who need to build up their strength through consuming you know, various good foods, you can't get them to eat. What do you do? You give them sugar. That will stimulate their appetite. That will kickstart their system and that will help with the healing process. So hence Grace's concern of getting not only sugar over to these soldiers, but good American fruit jam, the kind that mother makes. So mothering of soldiers abroad according to dietetics. The next slide, what have we got? Ah, so that's just a, a Red Cross sign showing that they too were using the image of the mother, a uh, Red Cross sign with the greatest mother in the world and she's cradling an injured soldier. If you go to the next slide, please. Okay, we'll get to that in just a moment. Returning to Grace's interventions with canning, I mentioned that she said that canning was a great force for education and socialization. We can also read this not just as a Republican motherhood indicator, but it's a scientific motherhood indicator. She's trying to make sure that women and their families are healthy through uniform positive dietetics. They're preserving fruits and vegetables for winter consumption for later consumption. If you think about the provision of, of greens, of fruits, of something as specific as strawberries, we get them all year round now. This was not the case during Grace's lifetime. You got them seasonally, and particularly in the winter, there was a dearth of fresh fruit and vegetables. Canned fruit and vegetables took the place and promoted health throughout the year. 
So this is something that race is offering, not just to make these women better citizens in terms of their ideology, in terms of their values, making them thrifty or patriotic or family focused. It's also something that is very specifically trying to intervene in and in their children's health, which under scientific motherhood is also seen as integral to creating this ideal modern uh, model American citizen. So this slide, this is an excerpt from a letter that Grace wrote in her position as chairman of the Women's Land Army. And um, it's talking about mothering of done by the household chaperone. And we don't really need to get into what it says. It, it's more up there as a placeholder than anything else. But for scientific motherhood, the way that appears in Grace's work with the Women's Land Army is that she actually seeks out a professional dietitian. Uh, her name was M. Estella Sprague, and has her develop a menu for these women volunteers that the household chaperones will cook according to. And Grace has great success with this. On average, the women volunteers actually gain weight during their tenure as these laborers. And that's pretty amazing. If, if you think of yourself and if you went out and labored eight hours a day on a farm for a six week run, would you expect to gain weight or possibly lose weight? Uh, these women gained weight and it had a great deal to do with the menus developed by these dietitians. And weight gain, of course, at this time for women is something that is going to be generally viewed as positive, um, not as a negative. In fact, this diet that they work out is going, ends up being adopted throughout the country for all of the Women's Land Army units across the country. Finally, the last slide that we're going to look at here. How are we doing for time? Yeah, not bad. Um, actually, a little long, but I'll stop quite soon here. Uh, this last instance of scientific motherhood for Grace is in her position as public health officer in Wilton. She holds this position from about 1921 through, I think it's about 1924, 25, something like that. Not for a very long time, but while she's in that position, there's a smallpox outbreak in Wilton, and it coincides with a town meeting that is to be held and is going to deal with a proposed tax increase. Grace, in her position as public health officer, says the meeting cannot take place. If it must take place, it has to take place outside. We're familiar with pandemics at this point, are we not? So outside is going to be superior. And she specifically says that it really should not happen because people will be afraid to attend because of the smallpox. And by foregoing attendance, foregoing giving their two cents about this tax increase, democracy itself is going to suffer. So here she is operating as mother on two fronts. She's protecting people's health individually, but she's also protecting democracy and all through her position as public health officer. So in summary, Grace is definitely a scientific mother, certainly far more than Hannah. And she lives out by example the reasoning that primarily motivated her fight for women's suffrage, that well-trained women were natural health givers and particularly attuned to diet, and that these traits needed to be harnessed not just for the benefit of their own families, but for the communities and the nation as well. So on a side note, it was really interesting that Grace is able to frame herself and her suffrage interests and, and goals under this paradigm of scientific motherhood. Because as I said, scientific motherhood, one of the main things it does is shift power over the raising of children away from mothers, away even from fathers, and on to scientists, doctors, and the state. How can a paradigm that does that empower Grace Schenck to become, you know, a champion of suffrage and someone who can articulate 
a desire and a deserving of suffrage on its basis. And I think the way she's able to do this, because this is not something most women were able to do with scientific motherhood, Grace is able to do it because she's a trained doctor, because she's familiar with dietetics, because she holds this public position of public health officer in Wilton. She is ideally placed in order to do this. But even so, when push comes to shove, which in this case is when a male doctor comes to Wilton to live, there were no male doctors while she was public health officer. She was the only you know, show in town. But when a male doctor does come, she gives up her position as public health officer, early resigns and lets him be the voice of scientific authority in the town. And this brings me to one of my final conclusions that these women were trying to get suffrage, they were trying to get the vote, but they weren't trying to change everything. They still, particularly Hannah, but even Grace, they still believed in very different spheres of influence and power and appropriate action for men and women. Men were breadwinners, women were not. Men were greater authorities in terms of science than women were. Men needed, you know, to act more perhaps even in the public sphere than women did. Certainly Hannah believed that. It's a little iffy whether or not Grace would have conceded that point or, or believed in that point. Finally, women within Wilton, even within Wilton, there's a variety of ways that women conceived of and justified the need for suffrage. There's a big difference between Hannah and Grace, but they work together and they achieve the same end. So even if you're coming from very different places, it may happen that the same solution is what you're going for. And uh, that's what I've got to say about Hannah and Grace today. Well, I think at this point, Julie, let's see if anyone has any questions. If you do have a question, I think you can unmute yourself and, and ask or, um, if you're comfortable doing that. Um, if you do that, uh, introduce yourself very briefly. Just tell yes, us who you are. Good idea. Okay. I got one. <laughs> I have a couple. Sure. Hi, Julie. I'm Virginia Hi. Gunther. Hi. Um, you know, I love, first of all, I loved the lens that you use, motherhood. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about this because I remember teaching this, and you know, when you structure it in U.S. history as Republican motherhood, you know, and mm -hmm. they're going to look at the things and you begin to see um looking at those three phases mm -hmm. how those cartoons and the attitudes of the anti-suffragists really plays out well absolutely you know, very much so For grace it's funny because kim kim knows i like grace it's not that i don't like hannah but grace is a very interesting person because she's she has that medical background mm -hmm. she's coming from the time of the progressive era with the muckrakers and everything else so this is just so, to me, I find it so easy for her to kind of go into that field of suffrage. And here I feel that Hannah is probably, you know, um, there might be a lot of things going on in her mind because, you know, she's giving up that sentimental value, but yet she's trying to get the vote for women. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very interesting perspective. Polit motherhood as political power, I never thought of that one, but I have to keep on thinking about that one you have to come back and do another one of these for uh, on a different perspective i'm beginning to think i should write everything down in a, in a little uh, scrapbook somewhere you'll be, ha you'll be happy to know virginia that i'm recording this oh good good <laughs> well scrapbooking of course you know very good um because hannah did it so you can do it too you can bond with hannah that way yeah yeah so yeah um these uh the different ways that Hannah and Grace were approaching suffrage. And I, I think I agree with you that Hannah probably had more distance to travel to become a suffragist Definitely. than Grace yeah. did. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right there. And I really don't think that Hannah becomes a suffragist until she's done being a mother, until she's gone through that, and until she kind of falls in with the Women's Central Club in Norwalk and with the Hill sisters as you know, young college educated women through the DAR. Because I know that she hears lectures on suffrage um, at the DAR from the Hill sisters and the Women's Central Club 
She joins it a couple years after they start renting the property from her. So there's a process of her being drawn in. And with Grace, you know, the first moment we see her in Wilton, she's already gung-ho for suffrage. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. No, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And even with Hannah, I've been thinking about this as you were speaking. You know, she's really into that sentimental motherhood. And I'm looking at the dates because I jotted mm -hmm. it down yeah. myself. Yes. Well, she may be looking at that right to vote, not necessarily as a personal thing, mm -hmm. but as being a good mother. Yes. A mother, you Absolutely. know, as being a good mother for the country, as being mm -hmm. a good mother for, yeah. you know whatever it, it, she falls into that republican you know motherhood yeah. that we know we yeah. see at the beginning of the country you know mm -hmm. by this time yeah. and grace you know grace there's so much i'm thinking about world war one going on she has got the progressives mm -hmm. she has that medical background oh yes uh, who knows you know she she's she may have been working in new york city in one of those community organizations mm -hmm. um, that are helping immigrant women it's you know. possible. Yeah, it's possible. The only organization that I know she was part of down in New York was a professional nurses association of New York. And in that she was the secretary. And at one point, uh, towards like, it was in 1910, I think it was after she married, she was actually nominated to be the vice president. Wow. And I don't believe that occurred because I think she was pulling away from those professional obligations to focus on family and family of course wasn't enough for her <laughs> when she got to wilton it was like this is not enough i need to do 20 other things as well yeah. um, but i'm not aware of her being involved in, in any because it's interesting i was just thinking she <laughs> must be aware of margaret sanger and the whole the whole well, she must be, she must you be. Know, the women's bodies etc and the mm -hmm. only way you're going to be able to do that is to change the laws yeah absolutely yeah, and one thing about Hannah that I didn't work into the talk, though I was trying to think of a way to do it. Um, with sentimental motherhood, you're very much responsible for the moral development of your child. Mm -hmm. So if they grow up to be a murderer or insane or a drunk, that is on the mother. She's, it's some failure of her love, some failure of her teaching in, child, uh, in their childhood. And Hannah's son, uh, Charles, seems to have been an alcoholic. It, it seems to have run in the family, uh, some tendency towards that. And her diary is full of entries where she is agonizing over her relationship with her son, uh, of going up to his house. He lived in the yellow house on Ambler Farm. She was in the white house. So he and his first wife, Bertha, were in that yellow house. And she would refer to it as her aunt Hetty's house, because her aunt Mahitable used to live in that house. Mm. So I will never go up to aunt Hetty's house again. I will never give them more money after the way I have been treated. Oh Lord, this is so awful. Um, give me strength, give me patience. Oh, wow. And so she was, she was quite tortured. So even as she very much buys into, and seems to buy into sentimental motherhood ideals, mm. she's not this thing in her life that must've been the source of some guilt if she's truly yeah. accepting all of these, she, she must be feeling some guilt and some torture about it. And yet despite that, she still believes, wonderfully, she still believes that she deserves the vote and she exercises that right once she gets it. Mm. Yeah. Great, great. Oh, strange noises, that's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> She's, 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 Myra, Myra, come on, Myra, yeah, hi, quiet, she's moving, she's moving my husband's slippers around, <laughs> come on, Myra, come over here, so I wanted to say um, that I found this to be really fascinating, not only about the vote, but about sort of the history of motherhood mm -hmm. and the fact that I was born in Weston, Connecticut in 1950 and that my, I would say that my mother was probably a pretty traditional, um, she was more of a sentimental mother, mm -hmm. but it was a sentimental mother in a very scientific family in that my father was, he was a lawyer and there was a big difference between right and wrong and black and white. 
and that you know when we were growing up um you know we were definitely brought up not really strictly uh, i think my parents were were actually very lenient but the the aspect of the perfect baby mm -hmm. the scientific approach to rearing us and my i'm i'm uh number three out of four so i have older siblings and um i definitely remember um very regimented diets mm -hmm. um we definitely went to you know our pediatrician his word was law yeah i remember my my parents saying you remember what Dr. DeBlanda said? Right, 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 right. And uh, so there was that aspect of it, and um, and I think that the the all of that the the movements, the education movements, and the movements, uh, and and especially your your um, your section on uh, on childbirth. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely remember, you know, when when I was having my kids back in the seventies natural childbirth was like oh you must be a hippie <laughs> like, you no know, it was definitely um i can't believe you're doing natural childbirth mm -hmm. i can't believe you're going to breastfeed your children because yeah. it had gotten to the point when i was growing up we were all bottle fed we were all fed mm -hmm. with um you know it was scientific um mm -hmm. you know formulas to make sure that we were you know the uh, the upstanding, outstanding, perfect children. And I remember getting special shoes and, uh, you know, straightening our teeth and, you know, making sure that we were as perfect as possible. Mm -hmm. And it was very much a man's world at that point. Yeah. So the, the domestic um, job of being mother was relegated to the chores of making sure we all got to our piano lesson on time, that the mm -hmm. you know, mom was cooking and cleaning. But I think that she really, my mother suffered. Uh, she was an actress. And when uh, she had me, I remember her mother, who uh, my grandmother was a professional violinist and basically, um, you know, blamed my, not blamed my mother, but, but basically said, what are you doing with your life? You're just staying at home being a mother. Mm -hmm. What, a, what a, you know, what a waste. Well, that was my grandmother's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and she was all for, you know, being more, you know, professional. Yeah. And so my parents were very traditional scientific parents. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that to be absolutely fascinating. The, I know this was supposed to be about the, you know, suffrage, mm -hmm. but um, just just having that overview of sort of the history of motherhood was absolutely fascinating, and especially because it was here, you know, and the fact that that with, um, you know, Ambler was on a farm as opposed to Schneck who was, um, or Shank was was more in town. Mm -hmm. um, so that could have had a difference, and and the the historic time difference also. Anyway, thank you. This was really fascinating. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, it's thank you, Julie. I mean, this is such a wonderful, wonderful it's really um, supplement to our exhibit, and you, we really appreciate. Well, obviously, you did the vast majority of the research for the exhibit, but this was really, really brought in. Uh, the, components that we didn't have time for or space for in the exhibit. So it really complements in a big way. And we thank you. And oh, I want to just say a couple things about the historical site, a couple things coming up. Remind everyone that the Artisan Show is coming up. It's going to be up online for a month. So you can visit all your favorite artisans and some new ones from November 5th to December 5th. And also, if you know anyone who has young kids or grandkids um, who might like to do a Halloween puppet show this Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, we're having Wonder Sparks puppets from uh, Brooklyn do the Not So Spooky Ghost. And there's information on our website on that. So if you're free on Saturday at two, and it doesn't have to be for kids. You, anyway, so, I, Zoom. so can, you could give it to your grandkids in California if you wanted. I have a quick question. With yes. the Museum basically being closed. How do we get to see the um, the 
the exhibit. It's an all online exhibit. Oh, there you go. There's nothing, there's no that, part of it that's in the building. You know, it's funny because in my mind's eye, I see myself looking around the exhibit in the physical building. So that's, yeah, yeah. Durr. <laughs> it's okay. really it's a wonderful exhibit. Yep. It's really wonderful. So with that, I guess we'll say thank you again, Julie. Thank you, Julie. And um, oh, my nice pleasure. Thank you all too.